Let's try it again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to ask, uh, are you ready to meet Christ as you come uh, to worship Him? Are you ready to have a heart-to-heart relationship with Him? Uh, our call to worship passage comes from Luke 8, 22 to 25. And uh, let me read for us. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. They set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went, <coughs> excuse me, and were walking, saying, Master, Master, we were perishing. And he woke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was a calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this man that he commands even the winds and the wa- winds and water, and they obey him? As you come, uh, you know, what are you facing? What storms of life are you facing right now? Uh, do you know that uh, Jesus is sovereignly in control over your life? To the disciples who panic and are scared, he asks this question, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Have you put trust in Jesus? Not only, uh, you know, put your faith in Jesus for your salvation, but for your life. You know, Jesus is God. He is the one who controls the winds and the waves. Even winds and waves obey him. We come to worship God. And uh, we want we come to worship Christ, who is sovereignly in control of all things. Let's co- seek, come to seek to have a heart-to-heart relationship with Him. Let's worship Christ. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, <laughs> we thank you for Jesus Christ, through whom uh, we have salvation. But one who cares about what we're going through, one who is sovereign in control over all things. Jesus asked the question, where is your faith? And Father, we confess that our faith is weak. Lord, help us to put our trust in Christ. And as we come, let us come knowing that Jesus is the one we seek to meet today, to have a heart-to-heart relationship with. May we come to meet Jesus as we worship. Let us worship Jesus, who is God, who who even controls the winds and the waves. Be exalted. Lord, be with our praise team. Thank you, Father God, that we're slowly getting back to having more people worship. Uh, Lord, be glorified as we worship you. We pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Let's rise for a time of worship. So we raise. Why is your love? Why is your love and grace? Why is your love and grace? You never change. You never fail, oh God. True are your promises. True are your promises. True are your promises. You never change. Praise the Holy 
Jesus, the only one that could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one I could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever be. We live for you.
sing, Father of kindness. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. From me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time. Faithful. Beautiful Savior, beautiful Savior, you have brought me here. You pulled me from the ashes, you have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have set this captive free. Lord, I I will rest. Yes, amen. 
Dear God, uh, we come before you today um, just confessing, God, that, that so many times we, we falter, God. So many times we stray away. So many times we run away from you, God. God, if it was up to us, God, uh, we would leave you. We would forsake you every time, God. But truly, it is your grace, God. It is your mercy that draws us closer to you, God. God, it is you who gives us the faith, God. And God, we're so blessed that it is truly um, that we have a God like you, a Father like you, um, that is the foundation that we can build on, um, that, that has the foundation of promises that will never fail, God, because you never change. Uh, you remain faithful, God, and you um, are good forever and ever, God. So God, may we just praise you, God. May we just glorify you. May we worship you for who you are, God. God, in your nature, God, and in just who you are, may we find rest. May we find in peace, God, that we can rely on you, God, um, who is so faithful and who is so, um, God, just, just so firm. So God, um, I pray that we, as we come before you, God, and once again, as your servants come before you, your servant, Pastor Andrew, comes before you, delivers your word, delivers your message of hope, God, in the gospel message, God, may our ears and our eyes, our eyes and our hearts just be open and attentive to you, to what you have to say to us today, God. So Lord, just be with us for the rest of our service, and we just want to pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As we continue our worship, it's time for confession of our sins, and a famous uh, preacher, Spurgeon, uh, once uh, wrote and asked, uh, is it more important for the hearer, the people who hear the sermon, to prepare themselves? Or is it more important for the preacher to pre pre prepare himself? Uh, some of us probably are thinking, you know, isn't it the preacher who needs to prepare the sermon? But he said, he argued that it is the hearer that needs to prepare themselves even more. It's interesting. He referred to uh, this text, Luke 4, 8 through 8, which speaks about the parable of the sower. Um, it's better entitled the parable of the good soil. Right? Let, let me read uh, this for us. And when a great crowd was gathering it, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rocks, and as it grew, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. When he said these things, he called out, he who has ear to hear, let him hear. Uh, did you hear what Jesus is saying? Um, you know, when our hearts are hardened, unplowed and fallow, it's hard to get anything sown, right? And make it produce, take root and produce fruit, right? Since I'm not preaching, <laughs> Pastor Amos is preaching, I am speaking on his behalf and saying, it's important that we examine our hearts to see whether our hearts are ready and yielded to receive God's word. Um, what is a what is Jesus getting into? What is a good soil? Well, good soil is a good heart, softened heart, ready to receive God's word. A good soil is one of with persistent faith, holding fast to the word of God, right? Because the issues of this life, thorn, uh, Satan seeks to snatch away what we've heard. And then a good soil is one with patient response, bearing up under the pressures of living faithfully. There's so much more in our lives. Are you, are you bearing up faithfully and holding on to the word? So as we come to the Lord in worship, uh, before we hear the word of God, let's close our eyes, confess our sins, and confess how our hearts are hardened, not ready to receive God's word. Ask the Lord to forgive us.
we seek to have a good heart, we realize that we can only have a good heart through what Christ has done for us, through his cross, through his resurrection, and through what uh, through the Holy Spirit who gives us. We desperately need the Holy Spirit's work in us through self-denial, right? Uh, Luke 9, 22, a chapter after what we just read, there Jesus says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and the third day be raised. Father, we thank you that in Jesus Christ, through his finished work on the cross and through his resurrection, we who have put our faith in Jesus have the Holy Spirit living in us. And Father God, through the Holy Spirit's work, we can have our hearts softened, plowed, so that we are ready to receive the word and yield fruit. Father, we pray as we come, Lord, that you would Soften our hearts through the work of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, help us to be able to not only hear the word, but Lord, allow that seed to take root and bear fruit in our lives. Lord, help us to meet Christ and make Christ, Father, through his amazing work in us. We pray for Pastor Amos as he comes to proclaim your word, Lord God. Use him as your mouthpiece to pro proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to us. And let this gospel transform you and us continually. We pray all these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Uh, at this time, uh, we will be dismissing our youth group students. Uh, youth group students will go and meet at the corner room over there, 704, I believe. And uh, as, uh, Pastor Amos will come and uh, preach God's word from 1 Peter 5, 12 through 14, uh, with a sermon entitled, A Few Clothes Later, Stand Firm. As he comes forward, why don't we greet one another? Let's greet uh, people next to us. Nice, nice. Oh. Hey, everyone. Sorry, I, I didn't know this was on. Well, if you're curious what I was going to say, I said nice, nice bling, but no, that's neither here nor there. Good morning. Um, we finally get to close and finish up the book of First Peter. And we conclude with Peter's final thoughts here. This letter has been written to a group of persecuted believers who have been suffering and they've been exiled. So how do, you end the, how do you end this? You know, how do you end this letter? It's hard to write any kind of good ending to anything. Because on one hand, you want to end it on a good note. You want to be optimistic, but also realistic. Bring closure, but still leave it a little bit open-ended. Hopeful, but still leave room for doubt. Bring this sense of enchantment and wonder, but not too much like a fairy tale to leave people with a sense of confidence that I've got this, but also humility and dependence. It's not easy to create the perfect ending. Yet the way that Peter ends is really by going back to the beginning, as if to say to all of us that the grace that you started with is the very same grace that will sustain you to the end. So here's how Peter's final words go. I'm going to read the first chapter here for us to give us a little bit of context of what I mean. And then I'll turn to our passage, read our passage that we have today. First Peter chapter 1. Here's chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. These are God's holy, inspired, and life-giving words. Let's give them our full attention today. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of, dis of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling his, with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. And skipping over to chapter 5 here, verse 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. 
Amen. This goes to reading of God's word. May he continue to bless it for us. And as you seek for that blessing, can, I, can you join your hearts with mine as we uh, say a little prayer? Father God, we ask that you would draw near, that in the weariness of our souls, may we be able to find rest in what your words have to say. Not I, but you. Speak to us. Help us to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Andre Ward, he's one of my favorite boxers. He's the ultimate unified light heavyweight champion of the world. This guy is a legend from Oakland. And on the road to becoming the unified light heavyweight champion of the world, he had to face the uh, intimidating Sergei Kovalov, also known as the Crusher. You don't get a name like that unless you have quite some power to you. By far, his toughest opponent. And during this match, Kovalov hits Ward, clips him right on the face with all his power, and Ward goes down to the canvas. It's the only second time in his entire career that this has ever happened. So you can imagine what's going through his mind. He's shook. A lot of his confidence is drained. He's wondering probably, probably can, I, can I go through with this? Can I, can I uh, get a victory? Understandable, right? In one of the rounds, as he sits down in the corner, his coach, Virgil Hunter, comes up to Ward and tells him, you've got this, okay? You've got this. And he starts naming other legendary boxers who are in the same shoes as Ward. He tells him, Robinson got up. Leonard got up. Ali got up. You got up. Do it. It's, I don't know. It's firing for me, but I don't know about you. Don't look very fired up. And Ward goes on to end it all, walks out as unified, undisputed, light heavyweight champion of the world. And you know how he retired? He retired without a loss. You and I, we may not be called to be professional boxers, but we all need someone in our corner, someone who believes in us, someone to inspire us to get up from time to time because we've all been there. We've all been weary from the pandemic. It's drained us. We've all known what it's like to be discouraged in our lives, feeling like a failed parent, mustering up just a little bit of strength that you have left. We've all been there. And we've all had our moments of self-doubt or doubt in general. This is, Peter Virgil, uh, this is Peter's Virgil Hunter moment in this passage where he encourages the church to stand firm because God is the one that's actually in our corner. How so? We're going to look at three things here. The call to stand, first, first of all. Second, what it means that we're sojourners. And lastly, safety. Where can we find safety for our souls? Let's look at the first point, stand. Peter says, stand firm. Now, standing can have these different nuances in the Bible. You would stand in the presence and place of holiness. That's why you, when you read the Psalms, it's always saying standing within the temple because lying is not something proper within the presence of the holy temple. You, whenever, you, whenever the book of the law was read, the people of God would stand as an act of reverence and awe. Standing would also be sometimes the posture of prayer. And the kings and prophets, they would stand before their people to address them as a way to show and project authority. Then there's this imagery of warfare, taking a stand against the enemies or perhaps one of conquest and victory, not a man can stand against you. I think all the nuances of what this word could possibly mean, the best fit seems to be one of warfare, right? Because after all, Peter's audience, they've been constantly being punched down upon as second-class citizens. So these words of stand firm, they probably took it as stand up for yourself. Let them know who you are. And that seems understandable. Seems understandable to us, at least. Especially within the years as we witness the rise of attacks on hatred against Asian Americans in this country. 
of older, older Asian men being hit by bricks and bleeding senselessly. And what did the community do? They stood up together. Not just the Asian community, but the black, brown, white, they all stood up. They protested. They said, this is not okay. Stand up. That's what we have a sense of. But is that what Peter means here? Because if you look the sentence before, there's this qualifying statement that Peter makes here. He says, this is the true grace of God. That everything that Peter has written is about what it means, uh, what, it, what the grace of God looks like in our lives practically. Peter's concern is not about, uh, is not about how, whether the world will change how they see us, uh, how they see the church, whether, whether we'll be treated better or not. To know the true grace of God means changing how you see the world. And everything Peter has written is about how grace essentially changes our relationship to the world because of our relationship to God. How God unconditionally loves and accepts us on the basis of Jesus, despite whatever the world actually says. Because the world says, you're only as good as your accomplishments. But Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you, there's a profound difference. Peter's call to stand firm in the true grace of God is really a call for us to have this unrelenting commitment to God because of God's relentless grace towards us. And this kind of commitment will cause us to suffer. That's the, ex- I mean, extensively, Peter has written about suffering. And you would think that grace should negate suffering, right? I mean, if God loves us so much, why is there suffering in trials? After all, what good is unconditional love if if the trials are just going to come our way? I was dropping off my kid to school in the morning, and he asked me this question. He asked me, Appa, why why does God have to test us if he already knows who loves him and who doesn't? Why does he have to test us? I thought, oh, I said out loud, oh, good question. I was just trying to buy some time because I'm a little bit panicked that this six-year-old asked this existential question that all of us have been wrestling with. And yet, how he framed it was interesting to me because there's this built-in assumption about testing that we got to prove ourselves. But grace is God proving his own love towards us by giving us his son which, which can only mean that testing, trials, is only meant to grow us. I always used to think that this concept of indwelling sin that we all carry and have, no matter how old, how mature we are in the faith, this idea of indwelling sin, I always thought of it as little tumors on our souls that God has to shrink down so that it doesn't impact us so much. But now I realize that's wrong. It's more of God growing us growing our hearts so that the indwelling sin doesn't control us so much. The demons in our lives, they don't possess us. We need growth. After this question, Miles follows up by asking me, why do they call this game Minecraft? It's Minecraft, son. And then we move on. That's the thing. You can't really change without commitment And yet commitment is what actually creates change. To stand firm in the grace of God. Yet the more you stand firm in God's grace, the more of a stranger, a sojourner, you actually become to the world. Which leads us to the second point here. Look at verse 13 with me. Peter says, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends greetings to you. Let's pause there. Let's clarify something here. Who is she and what is Babylon doing here, right? Who is she and what is Babylon doing here? See, in the Greek, this pronoun she has to find its reference with another feminine noun. So the closest one you actually find is in verse 9 for the word brotherhood. 
meaning Peter has in mind here believers all throughout the world, or in other words, the universal church. And when you find this word Babylon, Babylon, for, the, uh, for at least the, the uh, Jewish mind, represented captivity, a powerhouse who dominated and captured the Israelites, and they tried to erase their uh, uh, identity. That's what ba Babylon uh, symbolizes. It's not about a location, but what it represents. And, how, and in the opening letter of Peter, he addresses everyone as this, to, uh, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. So verse 13 basically parallels this exact same language. It's Peter's artistic expression that the church finds itself in the new diaspora, the new dispersion. In a passing evil age. This world is not our final destination. Heaven is. To be a believer is to be a sojourner. I find it odd that at this point Peter has to mention this. Because he's already mentioned this in the beginning and all throughout, the, uh, all throughout this letter. The, the thing is, I don't need anyone telling me that I'm Asian because I already know that I am. So for Peter to actually say this, it, it's uh, Peter's audience, they clearly know what it's like to not belong to Rome. They know what it's like to be exiled. They already feel like they don't belong there. So why mention any of this at all? Because Peter knows how easy it is for us to become complicit, complacent in Babylon. The novelist Edith Wharton put it best when she said, half the trouble in life is really caused by pretending there isn't any. Well put. Half the trouble in our lives is pretending like there isn't any. And yet faith requires us to constantly re-examine ourselves. How are we being affected by Babylon? Take, for instance, something like capitalism. Is capitalism on anyone's mind? Are any of you worried by capitalism? Not really. And yet, I'm surprised to find the patristic writers of the early church constantly make these warnings about capitalism, how if you buy into it too much and you don't check your heart, you're always going to suck out all the resources and how it's going to make you treat people like objects. And the only kind of relationships you're willing to have is ones that will get you higher up in, this, uh, in your lives. That's all it is. And he says, you, and the patristic writers made this warning, don't just buy into it, check your hearts. They're not advocating for socialism. They're just saying, we're living in times of Babylon. Make sure you check yourselves. I'm always grieved by how politicized things have become these days. And how politics now starts to shape what our faith should look like. I don't think it should be like that at all. Like, we talk about things like taking care of the environment, and that's too much of a leftist thing. That's too democratic. It's too progressive. We don't want to touch that. And yet, we don't realize that when God gave his mandate as image bearers, he called us to have dominion over the earth, which means stewardship over the earth. Stewardship over it. And yet, in the book of Revelations, when heaven is depicted, there's trees there. It's the tree of life. There's streams flowing. There's a God-given command to care for the earth, to steward it. It's not a left or right thing. It's a God thing. I'm grieved by this. Political affiliations should not impact what it means to obey God. God determines it through his words. We're in Babylon. We're in a time of Babylon. How is it affecting us? How is it affecting you? If there's any greater and stronger indication that the times of Babylon is already here, it's a fact that there's wars that can still happen. A war like Ukraine. And it's in those times where many people long for, come Jesus, come, Maranatha. Bring us our true home. It's hard to watch, man. 
to watch especially all the kids being displaced from their homes, not even having a sense of home. It's hard to watch it in detail. It makes you feel hopeless as you watch it because we're all helpless to it. And yet, Kathy's been reminding, my wife's been reminding me about this quote that Fred Rogers used to say when uh, kids would be in distress, and it's this. He would say, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. He has such a great way with words. Look for the helpers. You will always find someone who is helping. As if to say, there's always someone giving hope. I love that. Look for the helpers. Peter has them. A faithful brother like Sylvanus, who really is Silas, and John Mark, who were helpers that relayed the truth of God's grace. And as Peter also says to this church, greet one another with a kiss of love, but also extend this kind of love, this, this kind of love of embrace to a world that desperately needs it. Look for the helpers. I saw this where the Polish uh, mothers in Poland, they left all their strollers at the train station so that mothers of the Ukraine who are becoming refugees, when they have their kids, they can just use the strollers and cart them off. I thought, what a wonderful picture. Look for the helpers. No one's asking for us to save the world. It's just the little amount of hope that we need to give. Look for the helpers. At my kids' schools, uh, at my kids' school, there uh, these little elementary sk- kids' school uh, kids. They would uh, make these bracelets. I wish I wore it. They're selling it for five bucks, raising funds for the Ukraine. And I don't know why. Just watching that gave me a lot of hope for the next generation. Look for the helpers, just a little bit. You know, on August 24th, our little kids, the Sparks and the youth group, we're going to put together this wonderful bake sale on August 24th. And the whole reason why is because we want to be helpers. We want to just offer up a little bit of hope. That's what it's for. Look for the helpers. It's not just for the kids. We all want to know that someone will keep us safe. Isn't that what we all want? Which brings us to the last point here. As one writer puts it, a ship is safe in its harbor, but that's not what ships are for. I feel the same way about faith. There's nothing safe about our faith. There's nothing safe about faith in God. If anything, safety is something suburbanites prioritize to give us the illusion of control. You know how I know this? Because my son tells me that at their school, they practice a drill called stranger drills. And basically, they tell the kids, find the best hiding spot so that no one will spot you. And all this drill really is is a euphemism for active shooter drills, which I've never done in my entire life. Don't get me wrong, this drill is helpful. But the question is, is anyone really safe? Is anyone really safe? Faith isn't safe. Yet here Peter says in the last lines, peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peace. I doubt he means being safe here, especially to a group of people who are being persecuted. I imagine peace for Peter that he talks about is about being secure in Christ. And that's what he has in mind. We celebrated my mom's birthday earlier this past week. We celebrated on a Monday because I couldn't make it up in the middle of the, week, of, of, her, of the week for a real birthday. She's getting up there. And yet, the more that I see her, I always check on our Parkinson's, how much worse it's getting, and she's trembling more. And so I tell her, you know, there's, there's group therapy for these kind of things. Go see it. I'm trying to encourage her to do it. But she doesn't want it. In the middle of dinner, she tells me, you know, I've, read in the, I've been reading the newspaper, and I heard in places like Switzerland, they legalized euthanasia. So a lot of these older folks, they go out, they go on their way, they opt out of life earlier rather than later, rather than letting life play out. 
and she tells me, you know, I've been considering this option in the near future. You're a pastor, Amos. Is this a sin? Gross. It's my mother. She didn't know what to say. She explains that she's seen her mom's friends all with Parkinson's and how they quickly deteriorate and they just become absolutely helpless and they just need everyone to do something for them. I don't want to be like that, Amos. I don't want to be so helpless. I thought, man, are we all really that different? After all, isn't that why we fixate so much on our careers? Stuck up our savings account fixate on our bodies, whatever it may be. We do it to not feel so helpless. Not feel so helpless. This conversation didn't sit well with me the entire week. On the day of her birthday, I just call her up, and I'm just half angry and half concerned. You know, you know how that goes. I like, open up my Bible. I tell my, I, I tell my mom, I read the words of Isaiah 46, 4. I say, even to your gray hairs, God's going to carry you. Don't talk like this. This is crazy. I'll be there for you, mom. And like Kathy is writing her text like, you're dearly loved by our family. We love you. And we're always going to be there for you. And then she just stops me and just says, calm down, calm down, calm down. I wasn't really being serious right? This is just how old people talk. Thank you for your concern. I said, okay, well, don't talk like that. Happy birthday. Goodbye. Right? Peter says, we're chosen. We're chosen. Meaning that God has chosen to be with us regardless of what we are like Regardless what happens to us. You know, when Jesus died, all hope must have died for the disciples. They must have been thinking in their minds, was this all a sham? They gave up their entire careers just to follow him. And their savior is now crucified. He's crucified. And yet it's only a matter of a time for them to get the same thing. They're scared. They're shook. So they find a secret location. They lock the door. I, liked, I love that detail. They, they specifically say that they lock the door, like that's going to help them. And they're all huddled together like little kids. Like there's an active shooting drill going on. They're scared. And out of nowhere, Jesus appears. He stands among them. And his very first words to them are, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. It, it, it's not, you're okay now, you're safe, you're safe, I'm with you. No, it's, peace be with you. As he shows them the scars on his hands, his feet, on his side. As if to let the disciples and all of us know, I will go to the grave for you so that I can stand with you whatever you face. He's the kind of Savior who lifts us up when we don't want to go any farther, further. He's the kind of sh Savior that lends his shoulder to us as we wrap our arms around him, and he takes us to where we shall finally sit in peace at the wedding feast of the Lamb in the new heavens and new earth. This, my friends, is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Can I pray for us? Father God, there's millions of things that can scare us, whether we like to admit it or not. And Jesus, we thank you for your tremendous grace towards us that when we feel like we are done, you say you're just getting started, and you're willing to carry our weight all the way through. Thank you for the true grace that you give at the cross for us. 
teach us what it constantly means to stand firm, standing firm in this grace. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You have a special treat today. Um, starting this week, uh, we're going to have people who are going through uh, baptism and confirmation share their testimony. We're going to have two people uh, start um, off today. Uh, we're going to have uh, Nicole uh, and Elise come, and uh, they're going to share uh, their testimony, how uh, God has brought them to faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, yeah, I would like to uh, welcome Nicole first. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Can we start this? Okay, well, hi, everybody. Like Pujo introduced, my name is Nicole, if you don't know me. Um, I guess to start off my testimony, I really just wanted to talk a bit about my background and um, just, yeah, me growing up. So when I was younger, I definitely went to church, um, went every Sunday as much as I could. But the biggest thing that I think impacted my childhood was that my mom was Christian, but my dad wasn't Christian. And so because of that, there was a lot of differing values at times and different things that they pushed and pulled from me. But the one thing that they both said um, was that, they wanted me to find a good group of friends. Um, that was the one thing that I always remember them saying whenever I went to a new school, and said high school, college. And as a young kid, I took that to extreme. I soon found that my identity was just based, uh, based on finding the bestest of friends, people who could support me however I want. And my identity was ultimately based on that. Um, my emotions were based on how they viewed me, how they treated me, how they talked to me. and. If it was something um, different or I didn't like it that much, I became super anxious. And so I started living this life um, and then all the way up to college where, um, yeah, I just was a super anxious person. But then one day I just felt like God was saying, you know, that's not what I want for you. Um, I have something so much better for you. And in that, obviously, God had put a challenge in my life. And so in Junior year of college, um, one of my closest friends actually hurt me pretty badly. And as I would, um, I tried finding that comfort in friends. I tried seeking them. Um, but sadly, all of them were also going through very difficult seasons of their life. And so because of that, I felt very alone. Um, I was like, "Where? what are you trying to do to me, God? I thought you had given me a community. I thought you had given me people to surround myself. I did everything my parents have told me. So why am I so alone still? And in that, I definitely felt like God was trying to teach me something and show me who I was in his life. And so because of that, um, I definitely spent so much time with him. And so in this time, God really showed me about the sin in my heart. Um, instead of really taking away the hurt, he showed me that I had depended so much on people, that my friends, um, that could help save me, that I thought our friendships were invincible and that they could give me the peace that I wanted. And I had placed so many expectations on them, on myself, that I forgot that God was perfect and that everybody else was so sinful despite our own efforts. And so because of that, I started rethinking about my friendships and just, um, yeah, who God was in my life. And so Pascal talks about how there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man that cannot be satisfied by any created thing but uh, only God, our creator. And so... Um, when I was not filled with the love of Christ, I looked to friendships to fill myself. And as I desperately sought it and tried finding it, I realized, you know, how empty I became because of that. Um, when I put my trust, though, in, in my identity in Christ as my Lord and Savior, God freed me from the desire to seek comfort from others because I realized that only he was truly able to help me, that he was only the one that could empathize with me. And really the only person that knew my heart and what I needed at that moment. And so with all these truths, you know, I felt God freeing me from that pain I was feeling from my friends. Um, pain that I was feeling from trying to seek all the affirmation and comfort from others. And so, yeah, I found myself focusing less on myself and more on how I can serve people and God. And so, yeah, I realized when you know God truly and you seek God's love and are filled by it ultimately, 
um, you overflow with love and you just want to pour out to other people. And so I started praying for more opportunities um, to share the gospel, just to walk with people. And funny enough, you know, when you're praying for God and praying to God and asking for him to place you to um, serve uh, others, he always does it. He always gives places to do that. So I ended up finding myself as a small group leader for high school girls on my old church. And, yeah, I definitely find contentment, you know, in watching TV, you know, hanging out and doing whatever. But I realize that there's such a beautiful feeling and a feeling that I can't describe when, you know, you're serving God. And, yeah, so I realized after that that that's what God truly was trying to teach me and trying to show me. And so from there, um, yeah, when I moved to Hope, I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to desperately, you know, find um, ways that I can serve and how I can, you know, share his love. And so, yeah, I was definitely scared um, and nervous when I came to Hope. Definitely didn't know as many people I would like to, but definitely felt like God was fueling in my heart a desire to, you know, know him and to know the people um, that he had placed me in the community. And so, yeah, as I learned more about God and, you know, listen to PJ talk, I realized, you know, how little I actually know about God and his love. And, yeah, so it definitely makes me want to seek him more and know him more. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Now, Elise. such a good public speaker. Now I'm like intimidated. Okay. Um, first of all, good morning. My name is Elise. I'm going to be sharing my testimony. I'm going to read more than she did though. So um, I think I first came to believe in God when I was around eight years old. I had nightmares every night about people breaking into my house. And as I hid under the table, I was like freaking out every night as this happened. Um, these nightmares haunted me every night until my dad finally suggested that I pray to God. And so that night I did. Um, I prayed to God for no more bad dreams, and I didn't have a nightmare again. At that moment, as an eight-year-old, I truly believed God must be real because it's fun. But it wasn't until sixth grade when I truly accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior as a little girl who grew up in a Christian home, I foolishly had my own idea of what a true Christian was. I knew Christians were good people, so I strived to become perfect. Of course, that was my own flawed definition of perfect. I wanted to be the good girl. I wanted to live up to every expectation I had for myself and that others had for me as well. I grew up as the older sibling in my family and the first grandchild on both sides. Growing up, I only heard about how perfect I was as a baby, and I felt the need to continue to be perfect as I grew up. My view of being a Christian grew more tainted over time because of this. I knew about God, but I felt like as long as I was a good girl, I was going to heaven. I obeyed my parents, and I went to church every week. I thought I was as Christian as one should be. It wasn't until I started attending my home church's weekly youth group meetings that everything changed. Every Friday night, I was taught more and more about my sinful nature, and honestly, at first, I wasn't happy to hear about it. I was almost offended. I thought I was a good person. It took a couple weeks of hearing these convicting messages for my prideful heart to finally break. Only then did I truly come to understand the gospel message. I thought I was righteous through my own works and my own efforts, but after those weeks of conviction, I was extremely humbled. Um, first, I learned that I'm nowhere near perfect and will never be perfect. It was devastating for me to hear. Everything I thought was right was wrong. I learned that it is by grace that I have been saved, and it is through faith alone that I can be born again. No amount of my effort or my works will be good enough to save me. I learned to die to myself, to trust God, and to seek him. So on September 19, 2009, I officially accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. I repented for my sins and truly believed that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins and that his grace is enough. After becoming a Christian, my life has been transformed in many ways, but there is one part of my life in particular that has changed the most. As I said before, I was a perfectionist who never wanted to let go of the steering wheel of my life, but through the Holy Spirit, I began to trust and rest in God and his plans for me. I truly found peace that surpassed understanding. An example of this was just a couple of years ago during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. All of my fellow dental hygiene school peers were stressing out about our boards as well as finding a patient. Everyone kept asking me, Elise, aren't you worried? At that time, I had no patient and no scheduled board date. Everything was out of my control as all of my plans fell apart because of the pandemic. But even during that crazy stressful season of my life, I had a sense of peace that baffled those around me as well as myself sometimes. 
a peace that truly surpassed all understanding, as I trusted in God's plan and that he would provide for me. So now, through God's provision, I have become a dental hygienist, and I have been given the opportunity to show Christ's love through my words and my actions to my patients. And though I fail daily, I am truly grateful to be able to follow our God, who is merciful and gracious. I will continue to seek Christ every day and strive to glorify him until I hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. I appeal to your joy. Thank you. Amen, amen. Thank you both. Great job, Ms. Cole and Elise. Great job. A great blessing. I, I wish, you know, I almost wish we could do this every week. No amens out there? <laughs> Why no amens? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. you know, I, because, you know, it's so wonderful to see how God works uh, in people's lives. And thank you, ladies, for sharing. It was so wonderful. It's such a blessing. We'll continue to have uh, more people share, at least during this baptism. <laughs> confirmation season. Uh, so you can look forward to that. We're going to go right into a celebration of the Lord's Supper now. Let me read to you the, the words of institution from 1 Corinthians eleven twenty. Through to 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We've been reminded today through Pastor Amos that we are sojourners in this Babylon that we live in, right? And uh, the, the only way we can stand and the only way can we can be safe is through the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, we were reminded of that during our testimonies as well, right? And brothers and sisters, uh, this table is a reminder of Christ's grace poured out to you, his peace that he gives to us. So as we partake, eat of his grace and be reminded of his peace. Uh, this table is for those who have been uh, baptized as adults or those who have been bapt infant baptized and confirmed. And the reason why these sisters are going through uh, the process of confirmation baptism is so that they can participate in this too. I want to encourage you guys to participate in that process so that you can partake uh, of the bread and the wine. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to pray for us. And then as we sing together, I want to ask invite you guys to come from this side and then go out that side to, to back to your seats. Okay. And take the elements as we seek and we'll partake together. Okay. Don't hold on to the elements. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the bread and the bread the bread and the wine the body and the blood of our lord jesus christ we thank you for loving us to sacrifice your only son on the cross we thank you for the grace and the peace that you offer to us through your son jesus christ that we ask that as we partake that we would indeed receive grace and peace we pray in jesus most precious name amen as we sing let's all stand uh, to sing uh, you can come forward and take this uh, element back to your seat.
Amen, amen. Christ, on Christ's solid rock, rock we stand. Amen. Did anyone uh, not receive the elements? You can still come forward. Everybody receive the elements? Uh, I want to invite you guys to remove the top film before uh, we partake of the bread. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and when he gave him thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. same manner, he also took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your rich, abounding grace. We thank you for the peace that surpasses all understanding. We thank you, Father God, for showing us that through this communion. We implore pardon for the, the defects of the whole service, for our own hearts that are hardened, Father. We pray that you would accept us and our worship in Jesus, your son. We also ask for the gracious assistance of the Holy Spirit to enable us, Father, to be transformed by the Holy Spirit to, to be more and more like Christ. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you, Father God, for these two sisters today who have given testimony, Father Nicole and Elise, who who testify to your grace, your mercy, and your peace. Thank you, Father God, for what you do. We pray that you will continually do more and more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you for your patience today. We have uh, a lot more program than usual. Um, I want to uh, take this time to greet those of you who have joined us for the first time. We have Jonathan from our welcoming committee standing there to greet you. If you have any uh, questions, uh, he, he'd be a perfect person to answer. So if this is your first time, please see him after the service. Um, and uh, we want to remind you that uh, you know after the service, we have what we call reflection time to go over the messages that we heard so that we can continue to be transformed by them. Uh, oh, I, I, I know I skipped something. Okay, we, are, we skipped offering. We'll come back to the announcements, my bad. Uh, it's not time for an <laughs> offering, okay? We have more stuff to do. Okay. Uh, 
And this is a good thing, right? Uh, we, we can worship God through our tithes and offerings. And we can give online. And we can give in person in the back. And uh, for our offering, Elder Richard will come and pray for us. Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, uh, most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who left the safety and peace and the glory of heaven to sojourn here and to be gathered on this sinful planet. And because he fell, Lord, we can stand up. Father, help us to hold on to your grace, to look upon your son. Lord, as we look upon him, he gave his all uh, so that we can have life. Help us, Lord, to uh, look at that example and, Lord, give uh, with generosity and a cheerful heart. And Lord, would you take this offering and, Lord, do much with it. That 30 times, 60 times, 100 times, Lord, it will produce for your kingdom uh, glorious things for your namesake. Father, we... Uh, Lift up our missionary partners, uh, Dana and Yumi, uh, who are laboring with love and uh, perseverance. Father, would you be uh, in their life and, Lord, just bless them richly with your presence and, Lord, just all kinds of blessings that they may uh, take joy in bringing uh, people to uh, Christ. Father, we thank you for this worship and that we are able to participate, Lord, even through giving. Lord, would you Take our hearts along with uh, uh, the monetary gift that we give you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, going back to announcements now. <laughs> um, yeah, reflection. Uh, we're going to combine college and uh, Yagers for reflection and uh, Yag KG and college reflection. So you guys are going to meet in uh, the room right across from this auditorium. And uh, you will uh, we'll start around 12 o'clock. I want to encourage you to go over the message together. Uh, next, <coughs> um, we're going to actually have a church-wide prayer meeting via Zoom. Let me say this again, uh, via Zoom. Okay, uh, It's not here, but it would be via Zoom, uh, 8 p.m. on Friday. So please join us uh, as a prayer ministry team leads us in prayer. Uh, we're encouraging us to, uh, to lift up Ukrainians together as a church, and we are asking you to come and participate. We believe in the power of prayer. We believe God is sovereign. He, Jesus, um, you know, Jesus has control over the wind and the waves. He has control over the world. We want to pray for peace uh, for Ukraine. So let's get t together on Friday to do this. And we are uh, helping um, Ukrainians in another way. We're going to have a bake sale, but it's going to be more than a bake sale. Uh, Sparks and youth groups will be holding a bake sale to help raise funds. Um, but they'll be also selling bento boxes, <laughs> uh, dumplings uh, uh, made by women's um, Bible study, right? Uh, it'll be like homemade dumplings. Uh, you can actually go back there today and pre-purchase them today. Sign up uh, to purchase, pre-purchase them. The sign-up sheet is on, on the door, okay? So please, let's try to help also financially, uh, those that are helping the Ukrainian refugees by doing so. Next, <coughs> we'll see the vi short video presentation, okay? 10th, but 24th, okay? So it will be the Sunday after Easter Sunday. So, um, yeah, be, be prepared uh, to purchase. You can pre-order now. Uh, it will be on April 24th, okay? I think next, let's go to quickly to the other announcements quickly. Baptism class continues. Please pray for uh, next uh, set of people who will be sharing. Okay, I, I'm really looking forward to having them come up. Uh, and then, uh, as we talked about last week, you know, we seek to to minister to uh, to the people of San Diego through an organization. Um, you know, we work with an organization called Hope for San Diego, and they are encouraging us to participate in Solutions for Change Farm, right? Uh, there's a work day in April 2nd, tw 2022. Uh, please sign up with Elder Mark so that you can help uh, the community, uh, especially the homeless. Okay, so let's uh, now let's all stand. 
And uh, Pastor Amos will give us a benediction. Are we still singing with that song? All right, let's see the blessings. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Go in, go in peace, friends. The cup. Oh, sorry, sorry. Please take the cup and throw it away. There's snacks outside. There's corn dogs. Corn dogs. Enjoy corn dogs today. <laughs>